So hello everyone and thank you so much for joining this digital conversation which forms part of this year's International Literary Festival in Berlin. My name is Eliza Appeli. I'm a writer, editor and producer based here in Berlin and I'm really delighted and honored to be joined in this conversation by Mina Kandazami. Mina is a poet, a fiction writer, and an activist based between London in the UK and Tamil Nadu in India. She's joining us to talk about her novel, When I Hit You, which was shortlisted both for the Women's Prize for Fiction and the Jalak Prize. Now, for anyone that's joining us and hasn't read the book, When I Hit You is set in contemporary India, and it's based on Mina's own experiences of marital abuse. It follows an unnamed protagonist, a young, middle-class, educated, successful writer who marries a university professor of Marxist and post-colonial theory. Very quickly, it becomes apparent that these utopian communist ideals and this institutional endorsement act to a large degree as cover for sadistic abuse. Over the months of their marriage, he wages an all-out assault on her body, on her mind, on her work, and on her wider relationships. She is systematically silenced, not only by her abuser, but also by wider society. Even her own parents tell her to bite her tongue and grit her teeth. But it is ultimately her determination to speak, to survive and tell, or perhaps particularly write, her tale that gives her the momentum to resist and ultimately the resilience to escape. So Mina, thank you so much. I'm very happy that we're able to meet, if only virtually. And I'm so delighted to have the opportunity to hear more about this novel. Um, it's a work of so many extraordinary sentences, so many very lyrical sentences, harrowing sentences, um, and intricately constructed sentences. But there was one in particular that, that really darted off the page for me and stayed with me as I was preparing for this conversation, which is, the writer in me is stronger than the woman in me. And I'd love to use that as a, as a starting point for our discussion because it seems to me so rich and so reflective of many of the themes in this book. And I wondered if it was fair to say that this is a novel that charts a kind of parallel quest. It is a literal quest for escape and for survival, but it is also a quest about authorship. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, thank you, Eliza, for starting on this point and also for yeah, uh, picking out that uh, sentence to unpack. And um, uh, I, I quite, um, I quite struggle with it actually to. Uh, to because you know when you start saying the writer in me is stronger than the women in me there's already this kind of borderline schizophrenia about it but at the same time uh i i very much think that we have to acknowledge and accept that we exist in a multiplicity of selves with the multiplicity of identities and uh, it's somewhat easier uh to process this kind of thing as a writer than it is to process this kind of experience as a woman because um, when you when you look at something like this that you know like okay as Mina Kandasami looking at what happens you're like you know just as an individual these very private conversations that I would have with myself I would be like why does it have to happen to me or the other thing would be why am I unlucky or uh, or also uh, I did it again, you know, I, I made the mistake of not doing the right thing again. Or oh, a lot of women, I think, uh, I'm not even sure if the word is still very much um, uh, in, it's a, it's a word with a lot of currency, but we would say, oh, I'm a creep magnet, you know, I just uh, end up attracting these kind of men and uh, that's what uh, we end up doing. And I think, um, whereas as a writer, the way we, I, I would myself approach this question would be the question of, oh, that's material, that's drama. <laughs> but also, uh, I, and I think that, yeah, there is obviously a slight, a certain amount of, you know, disconnect. But um, but also, I think knowing that you're a writer, because 
the, a lot of it also has to do with society. So, you know, if you look at it in a sociological perspective, it's very possible to say a woman who walks out of a marriage, a woman with an unsuccessful marriage, uh, all of these are categorizations in which society is going to blame you. Whereas I think when you look at the situation as, oh, this is happening and you're a writer and what do you do as a writer? Then the question comes of, oh, you own the story. You, you plot the story, you plot your escape out of this story, um, you plot your role within this story, you plot um, uh, how far or how docile you appear. So I think it's all of these, but also I think writing enables you to talk about many larger things that, you know, happen at the same time. And... Um, which is why I still feel that, yeah, for the women in me, the writer in me is, you know, the strong, the strong point. Mm -hmm. It's so fascinating, fascinating what you say there about mm -hmm. um, these, these wider societal ideas and narratives that, uh, that inform the relationship in the novel. Mm -hmm. um, and that you also described there that can be so readily assimilated into an experience as a woman. And I wondered if you could speak a little more about those wider societal narratives that you wanted to draw out in the book and in, in this relationship? Um, I think um, I think one of those things that I really, um, when I was trying to, trying to write this book and actually uh, in many ways, writing this book was a process that started within the marriage itself, you know? So there's this one scene somewhere that, um, the protagonist says, because I know that I'm going to be writing about it, I know that this story is going to come to an end. Because we only write stories that have finished, you know, in some sense, we don't write an ongoing story. Or we just take notes of an ongoing story. So, so um, to talk about society, I really think that um, a woman in a marriage, at least in an Indian marriage, it's really not just the relationship with the man and the woman, because if it became that personal or just that just that limited to that individual unit uh, there would be far less um, uh, far less pressure on it to begin with uh, there would be far less stigma about divorce uh, far less stigma about let's say living together uh, this um, but unfortunately you know the idea that you know family is um, seen not only as the uh, smallest uh, unit of the state, but the family is also seen as the smallest uh, unit of culture. It's seen as the smallest element in which, you know, all of uh, patriarchy is reflected, all of your culture is reflected, all of, you know, your traditional and uh, traditional values are reflected. So when it becomes, uh, you know, and it's just two people. It's two people with, you know, different opinions or people with, you know, different uh, ideology. And therefore, what happens is to keep this um, to keep this unit intact, you have elements working within it. Let's say an abusive husband, a violent husband, but you also have uh, equal. Uh, equally powerful forces working outside the unit that just want this unit to stay. So it really is a kind of captivity, and. Um, so for me it was to in a sense it was to actually write about this and, and i actually want to use this opportunity to talk a little bit more about marriages in india because uh, the book portrays a certain type of marriage where it still is marriage where the man and the women choose each other and it's really done with a lot of you know adult consent about it and naturally because it's a very patriarchal society and um, this patriarchal conditioning and you know belief in violence as a solution it ends up as a disaster but uh there's like 90 percent of marriages in india are still arranged marriages and which i would argue for instance um like i would argue that these are marriages where even the what happens to the idea of consent because you know we're talking about marital rape right you're talking about all of these issues that are plaguing us even the book deals with issues like this but that led me to think a lot more about consent and one of these things about consent is how do you unpack consent in an arranged marriage? Distinction between the arranged and the so-called love marriage and, mm -hmm. and, and the extent to which that remains a, a, a very active debate in Indian society. And I noticed that a lot of 
the Indian readers responding to your book really re responded in particular to that exploration of a love marriage and the extent to mm -hmm. which you know extreme violence can still exist within the love marriage um and I, I was struck too what you said just now about all of these forces contriving to keep that unit intact and one of the things that's that's really very painful in the novel is the extent to which the protagonist's parents are are really contributing to this campaign of of silencing you know they are telling her to grit her teeth to to stop talking back to you know kind of grin and bear it mm -hmm. um, and then subsequent to her escape you know the novel opens with the mother who keeps talking about it but with her own kind of gloss on on events and then we also see the father also speaking about what happened to his daughter but again you know editing and adapting the story so it it really feels like this very beleaguered situation in which there are all of these competing claims on her experience uh Yes, I think um, yeah. So we, what what uh, what academics love to call the agency of the women is you know <laughs> is is largely lost in this. But I also think that um, why do these competing narratives exist? Uh, partly because. Um, and this is why I would I wanted to earlier harken back to the caste system and the system of arranged marriages because uh, people would say, look at this failed marriage within an Indian context and say, well, this happened when people marry outside caste. Um, like my own personal stories that my parents had an intercaste marriage. So people would just come and say, this kind of thing happens when you don't respect, uh, you know, religious uh, ideas, uh, caste ideas, you know, the idea that caste has been established for such a long time. So uh, when, oh, you see, this is what happens when a woman goes and chooses her own husband. You know, this is why we should always believe in the wisdom of elders, which is why, you know, we know for centuries how marriages should exist. So there is this whole larger framework within which any marriage and not, mine not to, you know tomorrow if you were to marry an indian not yours but literally any marriage within this works under this larger framework where people are going to say oh you did something wrong therefore you suffer but also what is this framework and that um which is why i wanted to you know address this question of consent is that any indian arranged marriage which happens within caste norms or you know it res respecting caste regulations is a consent under duress it's a consent that's highly under constraint so you as people are saying okay an indian woman of marriageable age or an indian woman who is an adult can sleep with the person that's either chosen by others or a person belonging to her own caste under such and such criteria and i'm like what happens when you take the issue of consent which is basically women's right to say yes or no but put so many constraints about it then mm -hmm. then this system then this very system of marriage doesn't become an, a, a relationship between equals but it becomes institutionalized rape which means that if you're a woman belonging to a certain caste you're only allowed to sleep with people of a particular caste then you you cannot you know use any agency of yours so so and this is the problem with marriage so i think all marriages that are taking place that are extremely toxic because okay mm -hmm. you you can say you hit it off but what was your choice like what was your choice like, did you get to choose who you're with even if you got to choose them you got to choose them under the set of x you know x number of constraints and this is why i think that there's so much like you know this is there's violence and violence so there's the violence mm -hmm. of a husband hitting a wife but there's also the violence in which a woman can only choose a certain life with a certain type of person who earns a certain amount of money who comes from a certain type of background and most importantly belongs to a certain caste so marriages are like absolutely absolutely disastrous and devastating you know so yeah that's that's part of the larger picture and which is why again everybody resorts to a type of narrative in which the caste system or the larger social system which is still ingrained with its caste thinking uh, would find it palatable Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's a larger pressure behind it, even though the book wouldn't address it directly. Well, I, I can address it in a meeting like this. So as much as the book um, is obviously dealing with a lot of very real issues in Indian society and is based on your own experiences of marital violence mm -hmm. and marital rape, is nevertheless not an autobiography, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's and it's that's addressed very clearly throughout the book that this is for procedural reasons for judicial reasons but perhaps most importantly for literary reasons mm -hmm. it is not a factual record um mm -hmm. i think you've described it yourself as a story about what happened to me 
And I'd love to talk a little bit about that with you because I noticed that in the book's reception, you know, there were a lot of extremely ecstatic celebratory reviews, but many of them really addressing the novel as some kind of you know cathartic survivor's diary. Mm -hmm. And you know, despite all of the accolades, I could imagine that that was also a little frustrating for you that that people were kind of intent on uh, appraising the book in non-fictional terms. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's, that's quite interesting. Uh, and again, um, uh, it tells you a lot more about them than it tells about um, what happened to me or why I decided to write it the way I decided to write this. And I can come back to that later. So uh, my understanding of this um, and understanding it or basically how do I locate this, uh, you know, uh for me the first issue is that in recently there was this article about how in the time of black lives matter a lot of white readers are looking at reading or consuming anti-racist literature as a evidence that you know it's something nicer about themselves or you know or about the fact that they don't want to be seen as racist therefore they consume this literature instead of doing active things so there's a certain construction that comes out of the type of literature you consume because uh, it shows you uh, you you it's, it's something that shows taste it's a, a little bit of bordo there i think you know how do you construct yourself what's your identity and what does it say about your taste what does it say about your social class what does it say about what type of person you are so i think for the market and for you know for a lot of reasons especially in the west to show this as you know one nitty or you know one powerful or one strong or this word i hate the most a survivor <laughs> uh I think yeah, this it, they were just like oh, you know, we are here to cheer you, we are here to you know applaud what you did, uh, we are here to hold your hands, and so the whole thing is that literature, which is inherently militant, literature which is inherently you know empowering, becomes an act for the first world reader or even upper middle class Indian readers to turn into an act of sympathy. So. The narrative actually in reducing the writer and not looking at this as literature per se or you know the structure of the novel or you know what's happening at the level of the sentence or any of that like or what's happening in terms of the drama or in terms of even the storyline itself you know what's the role that writing plays in the book to reduce all of this and to say oh this person walked out of a marriage and she's so so bold though i should have mm -hmm. got killed i think that kind of narrative makes it into you know somebody who is like receiving arms you know arms of sympathy here instead of you know money and i think that's so that's so not done that's so atrocious you know because that's like uh, that's also reducing somebody from uh, the intellectual cultural side of being a writer into you know this uh, pathetic um, side of just being a victim or you know as they like to ngo terminology would call it, but a survivor so yeah i have issues with that but i also think that um, the other fundamental so these are you know capitalist forces the market forces these are people's you know self issues uh, and also you know the clash of worlds so what is this kind of story that we find interesting from an indian woman so if an indian woman is writing about wage struggle not so interesting for us indian woman is writing about um, ethnic national struggle not so interesting for us uh, Indian woman writes about being beaten up. Ah, well, that takes our boxes, you know. <laughs> that's that's what happens. So, so yeah, it it kind of I think it was not intended at all by me, and it actually precisely fights against that. But yeah, it got into a box that I I despised. Uh, so yeah, so that's something. And the other thing is um, the reason why I also you know. Physically, I'm repulsed by the idea of calling it a memoir is because it completely reduces my life into one experience of a bad marriage because that's not what my life is about. You know, I was at 17, 18 publishing books of translation. At 17, I just left school and started editing a magazine, you know, to record Dalit atrocities and stuff like that. So I think that, you know, I should have the right to define what I call a memoir, what I call a, my life. Like, you know, I've, I've done a lot like <laughs> uh, i'm sure i could have done more if i had you know used my time more judiciously but it's still possible that 
that's my life, man, not this, you know. And, mm-hmm. and I think that's this this is that's a very fundamental level question. But coming back to the literary aspect of it, I also think that uh people should know better, isn't it? A memoir is something that's true to what happened and uh, its truth is to, you know, life. I think whereas the idea of um, a work of autofiction or a work of work autobiography, fiction, whatever you call it, the truth of that kind of writing is to the narrative, is to how things play out, how, how characters deal with each other. And I think that, yeah, there's a, there's a fundamental difference between these two that people should have been really really aware of but yeah it didn't happen and uh, so yeah, what yeah it's, it's, it's very <laughs> much sorry I, go ahead no 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 uh so i think one of those things that actually resulted in this was at the end of the book yeah, i was tired of telling people or oh, don't call it a memoir like at least you know let me decide what to call a book that I wrote. You know, I spent so many four years writing this, I should know what I wrote. And then I thought, okay, maybe the problem is they don't realize that I can imagine, you know, it's possible. People, you know, at some, until until the early 18th century, no, late 19th, early 19th century, people were, you know, Western ethnographers were still measuring people of colors, you know, bodies and their brains and trying to see how we behave, you know. So I think there's this element of residual curiosity about the other that has remained in culture. So I was at some point thinking, maybe they think that I cannot think or I cannot imagine. <laughs> maybe they think that Meena Kandasami or, you know, writers of the East can only write what mm-hmm. happens to them. And, you know, you have to sometimes show, no, no, I know, I, I can think, I can create. So maybe this happens in life and this is how I put that into fiction. So that's how my third novel was born. Mm-hmm. It was a kind of reaction novel. Oh, <laughs> yes. No, but, I mean, I, I, I really, <laughs> I, I salute you for that repast and I, I, I very much... Um, see what you're what you're describing and i mean i have the the uk uh, paperback edition with me here and Mm -hmm. i was just really struck by all of these adjectives on the cover all drawn from you know very uh, celebratory reviews but nevertheless um you know explosive shattering scorching bold courageous and brave Mm -hmm. you know these are all working to herald the book as you say precisely as this kind of um, survivor's testimony mm-hmm. rather than a work of immense literary labor and craft, which it so manifestly is. Um, mm-hmm. So on that note, I would I would love to talk more about, about the craft in the book. Um, mm-hmm. One of the things that I found uh, so beautiful in the novel is this counterplay between the the real campaign of silencing against the protagonist. So we've talked a little about those narratives that, you know, are Mm -hmm. trying to stake a claim in her experience, those wider societal pressures that are trying to shut down her resistance. And then, of course, there is a a very literal um, campaign of silencing from her husband who closes down her Facebook or coerces her into closing down her Facebook account, who patrols her phone usage, who curtails her internet access. Um, And then this one devastating act deletes all of these emails from her inbox, is signing correspondence in her name. So there's there's all of these layers of of effacement of her voice and her language. Mm -hmm. And yet as a counterpoint to that, you, Mina's, mastery of language is just so vivid on on every page there's there's a huge amount of lyricism as i mentioned at the beginning um there's extremely stark shifts in tone but then there's also this whole other kind of polyglot um experimentation at least for me between different types of language you know there's a lot of language from academia there's language from cinema there's language from computer games and i'd love to hear more about that real reach, um, real linguistic reach that you brought into the work and whether that's something that's always been present in your writing or that felt particularly important to this novel? Um, Thank thank you for the question. Um, I believe that um, uh, (coughs) language reveals a lot about what is going on as well. It it reveals a lot about um, uh, so power structures, it reveals a lot about whose place is what, who is allowed to say what. And um, so, uh, and I come to 
<coughs> even though I write a novel, I come to fiction writing from my other backgrounds, and uh, three of which I think are quite important. One is that I started out writing as a translator, and uh, Tamil is my first language, English is my second language, and uh, which means I spend an inordinate amount of time choosing what I think would be the most powerful or the most apt word to say what I want to say. <coughs> Sorry. And then um, the second background would be my own background as a poet, because before I started writing any fiction, I was writing poetry. And when you are writing poetry, you're still working with, you know, like a poem could be 10 words, it could be 50 words, but still with very, so you don't have any, you don't have anything that's superfluous. You don't have anything that doesn't convey something very particularly. So even when something shifts from one sentence to the other, one line to the other, one stanza to the other, there has to be an enormous... You don't have the same level of padding that, you know, fiction has. Like, it doesn't have... The transitions have don't have to be so smooth, you know. You just can... Uh, it's just like the change of feather. Like, in, in a second, it could be something else. And I, of course, the third background that uh, I bring into writing is that so this the tensions of language, then there's the tension of form. And the third would be the fact that, you know, I studied linguistics and um, right. and that lets me also, for instance, uh, what you talk about registers here. So there's the register mm -hmm. of, you know, party academic discourse. Uh, there is the discourse of, you know, feminist discourse, but there is also hearkening back to all these other feminist writers who similarly portray relationships or the use of computer games. So especially the language of cinema, which I think completely, completely fascinates me because uh, it's a language that um, is very removed from words, in my opinion. You know, there's so much that's conveyed wordlessly that uh, words, it's like life, but only better <laughs> in that sense. So, uh, yeah. So there's that as well. So is this the first time I've done this? No, I think even in my previous novel, which has also been translated into German, Gypsy Goddess, uh, there are these ways in which I try to, it's a little bit like, if you want to see me or understand me, would you want to see me at home or in my natural habit, or, you know, where I am myself? Um, so how, or how do you study a tiger? So you go to a forest and there you study the tiger. So where he exists, it's his sphere and you want to read him there. And I think a little bit of, that type of language is to say, how do you understand, for instance, a Marxist worker or, or, or village rising for a wage struggle? So you try to understand them within the jargon of the political party context, you know, within the jargon of uh, how do you understand how the police functions, for instance? Uh, he, uh, there's, a, there's a scene where there are 44 people who have been burnt alive by the landlords. And for the police, everything is just an enumeration of the corpses in the state in which they are formed. And it tells you a lot. It tells you that for the state, this is just bodies of evidence, you know, these are just objects of evidence. And this is, this, that's how forensic they're going to be, but they're never going to treat this as human lives. They're never going to look into the fact that these were flesh and blood people with actual dreams and actual, you know, relationships. And uh, how do you, so you could write pages on, you know, the dehumanization of the police, or you could write so much on how to make them better people but you could also just reveal that this is how they deal with your life and let the language speak for itself for you know mm -hmm. the, the and uh, this is what's happening in when I, when I hit you as well so the husbands would want to deny feminism but he's you know too progressive and too much of a brochialist to do it directly so he would you know try to make it a very and that's where I think language also tells you that people can play very sinister games. So you would use the language of Marxism, the language of liberation, the language of revolution, but ultimately for a very patriarchal aim. And I think that, yeah, sometimes language means that we don't accept a story for just what's told, but understand where it's coming from. And uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think yeah, to answer you very simply, because I think it's a very difficult question and uh, something I grapple with every day. I think it's very interesting to just say, say that um, uh, there's this, all these multiple layers that language lets me unpack, you know, and to see through, see through what's happening. I, I'm going to pick up in a moment on your uh, excellent expression of a brush list and, and the contradictions at play in the husband figure in the novel. Um, I wanted to just 
quickly refer back to your your experience uh, studying sociolinguistics and mm -hmm. one of the observations that comes through in the novel is the kind of silencing effects again and the, and the complicity involved in polite conversation and there are two or three extremely painful scenes of the protagonist engaging in these conversations on the husband's university campus um, and then two scenes at a different doctor's surgeries where you know there is there is both a co complete lack of inquiry as to how she actually is doing um, mm -hmm. and and then subsequently also a, a lack <coughs> of intervention when people literally witness her being slapped um, now I wondered about that kind of that role of, of nicety and that commitment to yeah, to politesse and jollity. It's something, you know, I grew up in the UK and I, I really recognize that a lot in British society. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered if it's something that to you as a linguist feels like a universal predicament or is it something that's rather quite particular to specific cultural or indeed class? context uh, i think i think no no i think it's a human human thing because um mm -hmm. and uh with the uk as well it was a i'm an immigrant here i have lived here um seriously for three years but i've been visiting on and off for like six years and uh, i wanted to start off with the uk because it's like you know in the book i unpack what's called uh the politeness phenomena in which people don't want to have a loss of face you know so you only ask questions in which you know that no difficult answer would come out so yeah the woman never gets a chance to even have an opening to say what's happening to her and uh, when i come to when i came to the uk uh, people would come to you know like a housemate or a flatmate would come and say you all right and uh, that was like you know <laughs> when you so actually, uh, actually actually when you actually hear that you're like oh somebody how did this person sense that i'm not all right that mm -hmm. i really need company or i'm about to break so you know i really had this habit of and somebody said you are right i want to always launch into conversation sometimes i have saying oh no it's been a shit day and then I realized them doing it to each other. And I realized that the actual answer to you all right question mark is actually you all right question mark. Yeah. So nobody actually answers or tells the other um, person if they're fucking breaking up, you know, like, so that's completely not answered. And then, and then that's when you realize that <laughs> it's just such a superficial, superficial dance, isn't it? So there's no real connection. And then I realized that, you know, there's layers and layers of it. Um, and yeah, I think that all languages use this, of course, um, in in different ways. So uh, our parents use it, for instance, if they if they wouldn't uh, want to know the answers to questions um, whose answers they would disapprove you of. Like, I don't think my mom has ever asked me, "Do you drink?" Because I don't know. I'm sure she knows what the answer is, but she doesn't want to hear it because if she hears it, it, if she hears it, then she has to either approve of it or she has to pretend to be scandalized and therefore react to it. So why go there? Why go into a difficult terrain? So uh, I think that, yeah, language is beautiful. But what was your question? I'm sorry. I got no, so interested. No, you, I got so interested in explaining what's happening in Britain. Which, you know, I just no, you, you answered it. You answered it very, um, very vividly. And of course, I, I know this this greeting. You're right, um, so well from 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 growing up in Britain. And as you say, it's more just a kind of assertion that or or, or greeting that you should be all right. It's it's really not a a Inquiry. question a sense of how how are you and I'm I'm genuinely interested in whether things are okay with you. Um, mm -hmm. But I think no, I just wondered whether you'd seen that. <laughs> As a linguist, whether you saw it as something universal, which it sounds like, um, like oh, you... it is, it is very universal. But again, it depends from culture to culture. I'm married to, not married, but I live with uh, a francophone Belgian, and it's impossible to utter something without that becoming an argument. Because I think the French take everything very seriously mm -hmm. at a lexical level or whatever level it is, and they also love arguments. So yeah, <laughs> so yeah, I think I think. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of uh, cultural differences on how people appreciate language, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, now, of course, in the novel, um, mm -hmm. the, the fact of the writers writing in English is something that mm -hmm. is that is wielded against her by her husband. And we mm -hmm. touched briefly early on his ways of, you know, selectively 
um, deploying Marxist and post-colonial theory in order ultimately to, you know, just beat her down more and more and more. And that's one thing that that he particularly attacks her for and says, uh, writing in English makes you a whore, a bridge between colonizer and colonized. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's it's a it's a brutal uh, assault. But I, I wondered, as someone who you know, is thinking so deeply about language, who is so engaged with progressive politics and the post-colonial situation in India, you know, how prevalent is that line of critique uh, amid post-colonial theorists, and how is that something that you navigate? Uh, there are two, there are a couple of aspects to this. Uh, so uh, this is a criticism that I get not only from, you know people like that but also mm -hmm. from uh you know fellow writers or others so you know if somebody had to somebody watches you growing up and then they realize uh, why she possibly you know more published than us or something and then the idea is that oh but she writes for white people and i'm like mm -hmm. no like no 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 if uh, you, you're getting it all wrong like if i was writing for white people there would be a reference to yoga in every page i would tell them how to you know um, how to take better care of the skins i would give them so much advice on the spices to use for i don't know aphrodisiac uh, um, so you know <laughs> i would you know appeal to all of their curiosity I would have told of the curiosity about yeah Indian sex life. So I don't do any of that. So uh, and yeah, I don't uh, do trauma porn. Even the one novel where there's poverty is people militating, fighting against it, and uh, standing by communism. So in what way does that appeal to white people? And um, and I also do things that I think are very irritating because uh, white people think they own fascism, or mm -hmm. it's only fascism if it happens to them. Then I, I write about the Hindu nationalist politics, and I, mm -hmm. you know, and I say that's fascist. So, <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I'm only doing a lot of rabble rousing as opposed to, you know, pandering to, because I also think that, you know, as much as um, I'm a writer, I'm also someone like a lot of other people. Can someone read the landscape? And I literally, in my reading of the landscape, this is not the, uh, the formula for appealing to white people writing at all uh, maybe i will try that at some point but no i haven't tried it yet um but the, this criticism comes when you write in english and to go back to that um i think uh, as much as it's a criticism i don't believe in my own work doing that but i also do a lot of translations so i'm like no so what about the translations i do i've done like six books of translations that have been published you know in india and abroad so you cannot Beat, use this English stick to beat me with because mm -hmm. I think there are voices that are far more important than mine, far more authentic than mine. And I'm not somebody who also, you know, just picks up some, you know, just a novel just because it has a good plot line or something. I do a lot of political translations. I do a lot mm -hmm. of, you know, translations of, you know, Dalit writers, speeches and texts. And um, I did Salma's novel, which talks again about a Muslim women's community there in a small village. So this kind of question against English cannot be wielded against me because as much as I use it to amplify issues that are very dear to me or as much as, you know, I could say to show off even my own skills and my learned language uh, i also used to amplify others um if not as much but actually more than what i do with my own writing so that's one of the things the other aspect is in how in many ways english writing in english lets me uh, escape levels of gatekeeping that i wouldn't be able to escape otherwise so it's it is in a sense a position of privilege but it's also a place where who would I be if I was in the Tamil landscape? So women poets who wrote similar poetry, uh, you know, were called all kinds of names. Um, and again, one of the things that um, I think writing in English somewhat shields me from that. But also, uh, the minute I go back home, like I don't know whether I go back home to Tamil Nadu or to Kerala, then once again, I'm reduced. I might write in English. People might look at me as, you know, an Indian woman who writes in English. But the minute you go back to your homeland, home country, or even the place that you stayed in for a few years, you become one of them. So people are addressing questions like, oh, how can a male rape his wife? And then you're like, mm, okay. Or like, are you writing about sex because it sells? And I'm like, no, I, mm. you, don't, you don't know how much money I'm making, you know? So mm. uh, so even if you write from English, there's a certain type of escape, but people would still drag you back and judge you by the literary standards of where you are from, or from especially the cultural and patriarchal standards of where you are from. 
It's really interesting. I mean, I would also say that that, that you certainly are using the English language to to rebuff a lot of Western tropes about the Indian experience. And you know, there are passages in the book that that confront those very explicitly. You know, there's 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 no. Um, I think there's this kind of sequence where you say, you know, there was no um, jihadi boyfriend, there was no child marriage, you know, kind of just yeah. actively rebuffing all of these tropes. So I think, um, you know, the writing in English also does a lot of resistance work against people's perceptions about what Indian experience should be. Mm -hmm. um, and, and equally, there is also still the presence of Tamil in your prose. I think you've spoken about Tam English as your as your kind of hybrid language of choice and and there are uh, aspects of Tamil in in the novel, right? Mm -hmm. I, uh, I do think that um, I uh, uh, I do think that yeah Tamil adds um, it's a language I inhabit very closely, especially being a translator so that being my first language. And also, I think one of the other things that possibly makes Tamil people much more attached about the language, everybody might have other reasons, is that um, we grew up, at least in Tamil Nadu, witnessing a second-hand war. Like mm -hmm. uh, in, in Sri Lanka, uh, which is a neighboring country, there was this uh, national uh, linguistic struggle, actually, for a separate nation, uh, most importantly led by the Tamil Tigers, but you know, articulated by a larger population. So you really kind of start understanding and unpacking what it is to stand up for a certain language identity and how that can actually end up with genocide, you, you know, like the most extreme form of violence that can be put on a people. And then that also leads you into a kind of defense mechanism where you become more Tamil than you should be, you know, like, um, like there are a lot of plenty of young people, like I know, I, I personally know who are like my own generation who just don't read Tamil because everything they consume is through English and they're like, this is really a very difficult script and stuff like that. But then something, there's always this outside trigger that reinforces you to take interest in your own identity, you know. And um, I think with literature, it's much more interesting because at least I, I always feel I have something new to say or something special to say because not a lot has been said from the Tamil experience in English. So I, I don't feel like I am rewriting or, you know, wasting space. I'm still smuggling in a different worldview or different set of uh, crazinesses. Absolutely. Um Touching back now on on the figure of the husband and his particular hybrid of extremely uh, regressive gender politics. I mean, that's that's generous. I mean, his extreme gender violence uh, mm -hmm. and his real campaign of ownership over his wife, alongside this sort of qu quite fated public status as a Marxist and post-colonial academic. And that's one of the things that's that's really devastating also in the novel is that these purportedly very progressive utopian ideas coexist with what what is tantamount to a campaign of colonization over his own wife. And I wondered also as someone that's that's thinking so much about power structures and about post-colonial India, do do you see that kind of dynamic of the abused becoming the abuser as as a pervasive kind of post colonial trauma, or do you see it in this context just a specific contradiction in this particular character? Yeah, no. Uh, um, wasn't Adichie who said something about post colonialism and got uh, dragged on for days and trolled? because she said something. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going there. I think post-colonial academics have too much time on their hands. I'm not going to save them my opinion on a place. So okay. mm. <laughs> on we, the can, other we can leave that if you prefer. No, no. I, I think, for instance, uh, there's a lot of uh, decolonizing studies happening. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe that some of I, I criticize all colonizers, bastards, should never have come there, uh, should, should, uh, have completely destroyed the history and the fabric and the cultures of many worlds, many lands. We've been footballed around uh, from one hand to another, completely, completely anti-colonial. But I think there is a tendency, um, 
especially led by Brahmin academics, for instance, to try to shift all of the blame of what's wrong in India with the British rule, uh, which lasted only 300 years compared to, let's say, India's you know history of 2,000 years and caste system's own history of you know at least 1,200 years. So what's happening is that suddenly you know the British take the blame for everything and Brahmins get away scot free, and that for me as a, an academic and Brahmins is, is, any, is the Brahmins, Brahmins 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 literally represents the highest uh, caste order, yeah. the priestly class, or you know the intellectual mm -hmm. class, the ones who kept education away from literally all of society because only Brahmins were supposed to learn. And I think that these people who have learned and are now sitting in foreign universities talk about decolonization, where all the blame on the caste system and all that's wrong with India gets transferred into these 300 years of British rule instead of actually acknowledging that possibly Brahminism with its longer history has done more to oppress Indian people, to keep more women out of education, to keep more untouchables out of education, Dalits out of education, that's what I mean, um, to keep more backward class people out of education, to keep more, you know, to keep people ac absolutely, you know, in the most dire circumstances. So yeah, it's very nice. Let's let's talk about exactly what the colonial oppressors did. Yes, the British uh, exploited us, took away our land, um, made huge profits. That's why London is so rich. All of that, I agree, I agree, I agree. But it becomes such an easy tool to deflect. So there are, you know, like apologists who say, oh, caste is such a good system and this is that and this is that. But, you know, it's the British who, you know, made it poisonous. And I think I'm completely against that. So, yeah, you can talk about decolonization, but let's de brahminize first. Let's mm -hmm. address this longer history of caste trauma, you know, which is against women, all women, and which is, you know, puts only the male Brahmin at the top of the hierarchy. Why don't we talk about all the violence that this system has inflicted on all the people, you know? So that's where I come from. So yeah, post-colonial studies is interesting. They have stopped even calling it post-colonial studies. They are so much into decolonizing, but yeah, I'm like, let your decolonizing not be a way to whitewash your own crimes, you know? So... That's not. Uh, that, that's something that they're going to say. Oh, that's why she appeals to white people. Like <laughs> <laughs> she writes her novels for white people, and then yeah, she she's trying to blame us instead of blaming them. It's just easier to blame them. So yeah, but no, I think you know we should look at our history much more because there are Indian there are Indian uh, leaders, you know, in, even today who are like the Dalit academics who say. The British came uh, 300 years late and left 200 years early, you know. <laughs> Not that they are good or anything, but there is a certain level of like, you know, Brahmin oppression and um, that needs to be addressed, I think. So, Mina, just as a, a final question, I'd love to ask you how you see the situation with regard to caste violence and gender violence in India today. You know, is there any positive change? Is there any cause for hope? Or do you see things regressing further still under uh, Hindu nationalist governance? Uh, yes, it's uh, you, you named it right. Uh, I think under the new Hindu nationalist government, which is now on the sixth year, you know, and they've got a landslide victory unlike any other time. So, uh, and they're aided also by the fact that there is a pandemic. So the state is in a complete state of lockdown and curfew. So there's no democratic process, you know, um, but many things that should be debated in parliament are not getting debated but it's not only at the level of um, the ruling class that this is happening uh, it's also happening at the grassroots so you find uh, a surge in the case of honor killings so you know so-called honor killings where women are killed for so there's gender violence is increasing domestic violence is increasing and there's been like in some states at least in Tamil Nadu like more than three or four times the number of caste atrocities that take place so, you know, Dalit people are targeted just because, you know, their freedom of movement and their freedom to protest is curtailed, which means that caste Hindu forces are having a complete um, freedom to do what they want to do. So, yeah, it's uh, quite a situation of despair at this moment. Well, I, I definitely derive hope from, from your work, Mina, and your activism and writing and all that you do to... to uh, battle these these forces and uh, thank you so much for this conversation and for your time and thank you for the really masterful novel that is when i hit you oh thank you so much for these engaging questions and thank you for also yeah <laughs> putting up with uh, my very haphazard answering but thanks no not at all thanks, no, thanks. take it bye bye thank you